Hey guys, my name is Liv and welcome back to LifePoint Online. I'm super excited to be here with you guys. This week we are starting off a new series called Thinking Faith with Dan Sweetman. So we're just going to head to him now. Hey guys, my name is Dan. If you're new today, I see a few new faces out there I don't know. I just want to just say a big hello to you. Um, just want to quickly talk about Alpha, which is on the screen. So we are meant to be starting up an Alpha this Wednesday night. Uh, we've just had, we've, we actually had quite a lot of interest. People saying, oh, we, you know, we, we'd like to come, but the, the time slot, we're just finding really hard uh, getting enough people there to put it on. So actually what we're going to do with Alpha is we're just going to postpone that and we're going to say, we've been thinking it as a leadership, what does it mean? We really believe in Alpha. We believe, believe in this opportunity being used all around Australia right now for people to just have questions. One of my favourite things to do in life is just to talk to people that have questions about faith and about God. And so we're thinking about how can we take Alpha to people. So you might want to have an Alpha in your home. You might want to run an online Alpha, which surprisingly, I, to me it sounds like that would be hard, but surprisingly they're working really well over Zoom all around Australia still, even now while when we're not necessarily in that kind of uh, hardcore COVID phase. So... Yeah, if we, we would just love you to pray for us with Alpha. We, we, we really think it's going to be an awesome opportunity. We've seen people already come to faith through Alpha, and we're going to keep doing it. But we're just up for ideas for how we can do it and maybe put it into the home and other ways that we can take Alpha to people. Cool? All right. How about I just pray, and then we will get into our message today. Hey, Father, um, I just... We just pray for people to come to know you, as we just prayed for uh, Rug Tag and so many people. We're already out there every day, and we are interacting with those that need you, Jesus. They need hope. They need life. And God, I just pray that we can, yeah, we can hear from you today, and we can hear from you not just Sundays, but all week, and we can be ambassadors, and we can be a light to the world. So God, would you speak now as we open your word? As we get into the big questions about life, would you please speak to us? We need you to speak, not Dan to speak. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We've got a new series starting today. And I'm really excited about this series because it's the kind of thing that I absolutely love talking about. So if I go a little bit over time today, I already apologize in advance, okay? My, our kids people won't like that, so I promise I won't go over time. But we're, we're, having, we're having a look at this idea, thinking faith, belief for doubters and skeptics. Those who go, look, I'm not sure about this whole God thing. Those who say, oh, look, you know, there are some good parts to it. Maybe, maybe people that have walked away or they, they grew up in it and then have realized after a while, I'm not sure about this. Or maybe you're some Christians, and you might, be, you might be a follower of Jesus here today. I know we've got plenty of those people in the room. And maybe you actually still have doubts. Or you're still thinking, I'm not sure about this, and I don't want to say anything, because everyone else seems sure, and I don't seem sure. Because the reality is, people have lots of questions. We just don't like to say it out loud, because we're scared, okay? So we're talking today about thinking faith. And I'm going to start by the very crux of the concept, which is, is faith reasonable? Okay. Is it actually reasonable to have faith? It's a big question. I remember a moment when I was in university and I had one of those awful moments like, you know, you know like when you arrived, for those of you who went to high school and you had like free dress days and you arrived at free dress day, I came here to Grace College and I remember distinctly a few times arriving down this street right here in full uniform <laughs> And you look out and no one's wearing a uniform and you're like, oh, you know that feeling? They're like, no, mom, can we turn around? And she's like, no, it's a 20-minute drive. You're getting out, boy. And I'm just, so then all day you're in like a stuffy uniform and everyone else looks awesome. Ever, anyone ever had that or is it just me? You know that feeling of like, of, I'm the old one out here. I had that feeling once in university, not because we were wearing uniforms at university, but I, was, I felt like that as a Christian at university. I, I grew up as a Christian, I was a pastor's kid, and um, sorry, it's really hard to preach because I can just see people having water fights out here. <laughs> Don't look behind, whatever you do, church, stay focused here. I'm, I'm, I'm the only one who gets to look behind. And uh, I was at university, and I went into this, I was doing this degree, a Bachelor of Creative Industries, majoring in drama, so you can already think this is going to be a difficult place. And I was there, and I actually had a really good time in uni, but man, I felt like an odd one out being a Christian. We had this one subject, and it was a worldview subject. And I just still remember this moment. So every week, they'd bring someone in to talk about a different worldview. 
Which I thought, what a great idea. Expose people to different ideas, you know what I mean? Very tolerant society. So we had someone from uh, the Buddhist point of view, the Buddhist faith come in, and they, it was a monk, and they talked about Buddhism and how wonderful it is. And then we had someone from Islam come in, and they talked about the Islamic faith and how wonderful it is. And I had a look at the schedule, and lo and behold, next week's Christianity. I'm like, this is brilliant. My, I guess it's wonderful. And on the Christianity week, they had an atheist come in and talk about how Christianity is stupid. <laughs> Literally, got to go to the front and said, look, we all know we've grown up from these fairy tale ideas and it can't possibly be true. And I, there was this girl in the front row, um, her name was Kathy, and bless her heart, I was just terrified at the back. She was down the front and she kept putting her hand up and she was like a Christian and just a warrior for the faith and she was just so angry and so worried. And she's like, it's, no, that's not right. And she's like yelling out, it's not right, what are you saying? And everyone's like, and then he, he says to her, I still remember, he says, sweetheart, when you grow up, you'll realize that this possibly can't be true and we need to put fairy tales to bed. One day you'll understand this. And I, I wasn't angry, actually. I was just, to be honest, scared. I felt like that kid in the uniform going, oh, it's all wrong. <laughs> Is it all wrong? Because, like, I've grown up as a Christian. Maybe I've just, my, my parents, like, brainwashed me. Maybe this whole thing's not true. And I suddenly thought, so I went on a real journey after that day. This guy seemed really, really smart, way smarter than me. And here he is saying, he studied history, he studied the Bible, and he's worked out it can't possibly be true. He's trying to tell me all the books are written hundreds of years after, and the whole thing's made up, and it's a big conspiracy, and he's getting his facts from the Da Vinci Code, which is a fiction book. But anyway, I was like, what, what's going on here? Is faith reasonable? I reckon 100 years ago, if you asked that question, people would be like, what are you talking about? It's like saying, is blue, blue? <laughs> is an orange, orange? It's only these days we actually have to ask the question because we have bought into uh, a narrative. Our whole culture, doesn't matter what you believe, if you live in Western culture, which if you're here today, you do for at least a little bit, we've bought into a narrative. We've bought into a myth about how our world uh, functions and how our world began, and it looks a little bit like this. I call it the myth that science has beaten the church. The myth goes like this. Hundreds of years ago, 500 years ago, the church was the, it was the be-all and end-all. It had all the answers. Everyone believed it. But then something happened to the church. And in about 1600, there was a scientific revolution. And after that, basically the church has been on, on retreat and on the way out ever since. There was the 1700s, who had the Enlightenment. You might have heard of this, the Enlightenment. 1859, what happened? Darwin's Origin of Species came out, and that was like the death blow for Christianity and the Bible. All of a sudden, there were other ways to explain things that, that Christians couldn't handle. Christianity receded, and science gradually won because science had better answers. Because science, so the narrative goes, uses reason, and faith just guesses, just uses blind belief. Leave your brain at the door, kind of faith. No one wants to say it, maybe, but, you know, there's this idea everyone thinks, oh, the church is, you know, it's dying. And if it's not already dead, it'll, it'll one day just be completely irrelevant and no one will really care about it. You heard, you heard something like this? You kind of get that this is a kind of a, a narrative that's kind of in our culture a lot? The problem with it is, is it doesn't hold up to history at all. It doesn't actually hold up to the facts. Even just a cursory glance of history, you can see the church hasn't actually been declining since the Middle Ages. In fact, it's growing faster now than ever. And it's bigger right now than it ever has been before. It doesn't actually hold up to what's actually going on. There's a few examples I can think of. Christianity in Australia, after Darwin's Origin of Species came out, went up. More people started going to church after that came out. The same thing happened in World War II. After World War II, you know, you think everyone's, you know, actually church attendance goes up. We think church attendance in Australia used to be huge, and now it's tiny. And there, and there, and, and there are some truths to that, but the reality is it was, wasn't very good in the 1920s either. If you look at church attendance in the 1920s, it was terrible. And after the war, people started going back to church right up to the 1950s when Billy Graham came, and there was an amazing work of God in our, in our nation. The 20th and the 21st century, some of the most scientific centuries in history, in fact, the most scientific centuries, they were the biggest in growth. 
for the Christian church. But that's not what this narrative says. It says that the church is on the way out. People don't go anymore. And it's true, you know, you look at the census data, it's true that Australians don't go to church as much. We all know that's true, hey. In the last census, in 2011, 2016 was our last census, there are about a million people less that tick Christian, all right? So you could say, whoa, okay, the church is really losing people fast. A million people left the church in the last five years in Australia. But you look at church attendance rates, and they're completely steady. They haven't gone down at all in that time. So did the church lose any people on that time? No. It's still healthy. It's still vibrant. Clearly science and reason haven't beaten faith. Is faith reasonable? Now, it's easy for us to sit in a church service. It's, oh, there's bad people out there. Things they're saying, they're saying wrong things. We've got the truth in here. We're right. We don't want to get into that, okay? We're going to start bashing our culture. I actually think some of the problem has not been outside the church. It's been inside the church. I actually think that one of the problems is people have started to see faith as something that's blind. People, people in the church, I think, sometimes put faith in the same concept as stupidity. <laughs> as in, like, you should believe it even if you're not sure it's true. When faith is actually something very different to that, biblical faith. So we're going to look at the Bible today. We're going to, we're going to have a look at evidence from the Bible and from our, our, our world and from our life over the next six weeks. Today, I just wanted to look at the idea is what does faith even mean? What does it mean to have faith? So we're going to look at Hebrews 11. If you're one of those people with a paper Bible, that'd be awesome if you got that out or on your phone. And you can have a look at the whole chapter. We haven't got time to get into the whole thing. Uh, we'll just be having a look at a couple of bits. But it's actually the only place in the Bible where it really clearly says what faith is. So have a read of this. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. That's the Bible's definition of faith. The author of Hebrews, we don't know who they were. They were anonymous. Some people think it's Paul or it's Apollos. or We're not sure who it was, but we do know it's a book about Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and this is in Hebrews 11. It's like the, its best chapter. It's about these incredible men and women of faith. Here's the problem, though. I look at that. You know, it's okay to question the Bible, hey, you know that, that that's allowed. <laughs> if you're looking for truth, that's okay. And I, I question this, because I look at this verse, and I think, faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance of what we do not see. And I think, I'm a little bit worried if it's talking about confident and something you hope is true, but it's not true. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I really hope Aaron's going to give me a million dollars tomorrow. And so faith is being confident he's going to do it, even though I don't think it's going to happen. Like that, that, that's a worrying kind of faith. Is that what they're talking about? Or being sure about something you can't see? Like that, I don't know. I just... I feel like some people read that and we think about what faith is, and here's the definition we get. It'll be up on the screen. We say, faith is the act of making ourselves sure of something that we actually aren't. That's the definition I feel, and sometimes in Christian circles, I hear. You're not sure about it? All right, well, just make yourself sure. So, oh, that person wasn't healed, didn't pray with enough faith. You weren't sure enough. I'm like, but I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, I'll make myself sure. Okay. <sighs> now, I'm really sure. Like that, it's, it's a scary definition of faith, isn't it? To think, oh, if I just make myself sure enough, then, then, then I know I'm truly okay. Have faith, you know? I said, oh, so some people come with questions, and I hate when people say, oh, you're overthinking it. You're overthinking it. Just have faith. <laughs> I said, just turn the brain off. I don't think that's what the author's trying to say. And so I did a bit of research this week. I had a look at, even had a look at the original language in Greek. That word for confidence is upostasis, and the word for assurance is ilangos. And here's what I think it Here's what I think maybe is a better translation, okay? This is, this is from the Contemporary English Bible. It kind of means the same thing, but you can just kind of get a tweak and see. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. Can you, can you just see a slight difference in the way that's translated? The, any kind of translation, it's always hard, isn't it? Like if you ever tried to translate a language before, there's never a direct word. It, never, it perfectly matches up. 
All right. So from the from the original language, that well, these guys are they're smart people. They're trying their best to say, hey, what does this look like? And I think faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. Another, uh, the old King James says it's the substance of what we hope for. It's the evidence of what we don't see. Faith is not the act of making ourselves sure of something that we actually aren't. It seems like it's a different idea. When you look at it, it's about reality. It's about proof. Here's my, here's my definition, okay? This is Dan's definition, so this isn't in the Bible. This is what I think faith is. Faith is having such a good reason to believe something you can't see yet that you take action as if you can. Does that make sense? You've got such a good reason to believe it. You, you, you've had a look at the evidence. You've had an experience. You really guess I've got a really good reason to believe this, that you start to take an action as if it's, you can already see it. Even though you can't see it. So there is an act, there's always an act of faith that says, I can't see it yet. Does this make sense? You guys actually do this all the time. That's how you got here today, all right? You had faith that your car hasn't got a flat battery. And, so, and, and you can't see the battery. You don't know how it works. You don't even, most of you don't even know how an engine works. <laughs> I know I don't. And you just had faith. You just went out there and said, I am 100% sure I'm going to turn this engine on and I'm going to be able to get to church. And here you are. It worked. You acted in faith. Some of you, even though our website said 9.30 a.m., you are sure that we're not going to start at 9.30 a.m. And guess what? We didn't. <laughs> no, I know I can rock up late. Because <laughs> you, you're sure. You've actually experienced it. You know what I mean? How do you come, why, where do you get your faith? You've experienced it. You've, you, you've looked at the past. You said, what's actually been going on in my life? What's the evidence say? What's the reality of what's going on here? That's what faith is really is. It's not a head game, all right? Faith is not in a fight with reason. <laughs> faith over here, reason over here, he's going to win. It's like reason is how faith starts. Can I just say, if you've got no good reason to believe in Christianity, don't believe in it, all right? If there's no reason for something to be true, just, it's, just don't believe in it. Don't try and make yourself believe something that you don't think actually is real. That's not what faith is. I think one thing here that we need to uh, highlight is it's not just something that's happening in your mind, okay? If you've got a Bible in front of you, you can look at Hebrews 11 and you'll see in Hebrews 11, there's not much about what's happening in people's minds, okay? <laughs> we'll take a look at this, these verses. It's not a mind game. By faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she, what did Sarah do? Everyone say it. One, two, three considered. She considered. She had to think. Considered him faithful who made the promise. By faith, Abraham, this is one of the, like the craziest stories in the Bible. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. And I'm not going to get into that today, but like I, I purposely picked one of the craziest stories in the Bible of, when it comes to faith. He who, who, he who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham, what did Abraham do? Reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. And then regardless of what you think, you might not be a, a believer or a Christian here today, and you look at a story about someone sacrificing their son, and you're rightly freaked out, okay? That story is in there to really shock people and freak people out, all right? I won't go into all the reasons behind that, but I will go into this. Abraham wasn't taking blind faith, okay? He wasn't just going, all right, whatever you say, God, no idea if that's right, but I'm just going to go do whatever you say because I'm a robot and I've been brainwashed. <laughs> no, he says he reasoned. He thought, what's my God done in the past? How, God, how has God treated me in the past? What's God done? He's looking at himself. He's 150, Sarah's 120, and they had a baby. <laughs> like, okay, it's pretty good evidence that actually God is with us because he promised something and then it happened. All right. So somehow, God's going to sort this out. Somehow, actually, through Isaac, my offspring are going to be reckoned, so Isaac's fine. I'm going to trust in faith, through reason, that my son is going to be fine, even though I can't quite see it yet. And as we act in faith, this is the most important part, as we act in faith, we start to experience it. 
That's why faith is not something that happens in your head. It's something that starts in your head and goes into your actions, yeah? Because actually acting it, start to, you, you start to see the reality as you act in faith. I, I used to be really into running. And uh, a few years ago, I ran all the way through winter. And that's really hard to do. So you guys should think I'm pretty good. Yeah? Okay, thanks. That, that's the whole story. Okay, next. <laughs> and and I, I ran all the way through winter. And I had to act in faith. All right? I got up at 5 a.m. And whoever said Queensland doesn't get cold hasn't got up at 5 a.m. Am I right? It's very cold in the middle of winter in Queensland. I got up and I knew something. I knew in faith that I was going to get hot when I run. I'm going to get warm. So I put my shorts on and my singlet on and went outside. And was I warm? (laughs) No, I was freezing cold. And sometimes people would walk past me in gloves and a beanie and walk past me going, what is that idiot doing? Why is he dressed like that? (laughs) It doesn't seem right. But in faith, I knew if I just continue to run, I'm going to get warm. So I started to run. Got got to the first block. I can't feel my hands anymore. I'm so cold. Got to the second block. My nose is freezing. At that point, if I did not have faith, I'd pull out. Okay, this is silly. This is stupid. I should go get a jumper. But as I walk in faith, as I act in faith, my body starts to heat up. I knew it was going to happen. So half an hour in, I feel great. And and I'm just so glad I didn't bring a jumper or a track pants with me (laughs) because I've tried that and it's awful. As we start to act, as we start to step out, what we cannot see yet begins to become a reality. And friends, that's how the kingdom of God works. So to you today, to the believers that have some sneaky doubts you don't want to tell anyone about, Let's start to act it out. Let's just start to just act in love. To live out the kingdom of God to those around us, even though they don't reciprocate sometimes, even though it's really difficult and it's hard and you're confused, let's start to act it out. And, 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 and to those of you who are exploring, you're on the journey. I know there's some of you guys here today that you're going, I'm not sure about the whole faith thing, or I used to be sure, I'm not anymore. How does it all work? Or maybe you've kind of walked away. Or maybe you're just exploring, you don't even know anything about God. I invite you to be skeptical, okay? I invite you to be so skeptical that you're skeptical about your skepticism. (laughs) All right? Be extra skeptical. Take it to its logical conclusion. Doubt your doubts. Have a look at how Paul does it. I'm just going to finish with this. This is Paul the Apostle in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. This is verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Okay, so Paul presented some evidence to this thriving metropolis economic city. Sometimes we have ageism. We think that because we're living in this age that people behind us were stupid. These were the, this is a Greek current city. They weren't stupid, okay? They are just as intelligent as you and I. And he's talking to them. He says, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, as in if you actually acted out. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, he talks about how he got his faith, I passed on to you as first importance. This is one of the best gospel summaries you'll find in the Bible. If you're not a Christian here today, have a listen. This is what we believe. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. What's of first importance? Not an idea. Not a concept. There's no other religion that says this. Other religions say, hey, here's some interesting concepts. Here's some good ideas. No, it's based on an event. Jesus died for the forgiveness of sins and he was risen. I love that our faith is on an event because guess what? An event can be disproven. (laughs) And he actually says, like, don't take my word for it. Just go ask some people. There's like 500 people you could ask. And most of them are still alive. He's not trying to skirt around the fact. He's like, just go and ask one of these people. Surely 500 people didn't hallucinate at the exact same time. 
Go and look into it. That's where it starts. Our faith starts in reason. I never want to say to someone, stop thinking too much. (laughs) If you've got questions, if you know someone with questions, the word leap of faith, the word blind faith, never appears in the Bible, okay? That's not a biblical concept. It starts with a reason. But there's one thing we need to do. We need to surrender our self-sufficiency, okay? Here's, I think, the trap in our individualistic secularism that we live in today. We think that if I just work out the truth for myself, I'll get to the bottom of it. None of you here are smart enough to get to the bottom of life yourself, okay? You must surrender. And we actually all do. We all surrender to a group of people that we trust. And that's why we put our faith in the Bible, because that's basically doing what Paul just said there. Put your faith in the witness of those who have gone before you. Put your faith in in the community. Let's work it out together as a group. Let's go on this journey together because we've all experienced, we've all seen, and we've all heard, and we've all based our faith on an event, not on a feeling, not on a concept. I'm going to finish with an illustration, okay? Um, I just need a chair. Jess, can you just get a single chair for me? Is that all right? I'm going to finish on this. Just a hello to all of our church online viewers. How you going? Everyone say hello. Oh, she no, they can't see you. Don't worry about it. It's weird. Okay, Jace, I need you to put the chair somewhere behind me on the stage. Oh, I'm not going to see where, okay? And then I'm going to trust the community of faith to guide me to the truth, even though I can't see it. Yeah? Can I trust you? Okay. okay I'm not going to look back. You guys have to guide me. Who can I trust? Someone over here. <laughs> okay, okay. Show, show me. Where am I going? This way? Back? Is there a cord behind me or anything? Okay. This is what we do as a church community. We guide each other to the truth. Now where do I go? Back? Heidi's down the front. I trust her. Can I sit? I'm not going to look. You, you guys, the, this is a prank. They will really roll my illustration about trusting the church. There you go. Round of applause. That's what faith looks like, okay? Did I have a good reason to believe it was there? Of course I did. I trust you wonderful people, all right? Was, could I see it? No. Can I still see it? I, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't looked at the chair yet. I still can't see the chair. But as I sit down, I experience the reality of what I cannot see yet. And that's what faith is. And that's what I hope we do over the next few weeks, yeah? Yeah. Let's stand up together and we're going to uh, respond to God in faith, standing on the event in history where everything changed. So Lord, I, uh, I come before you knowing that I'm, I humbly come before you knowing I haven't got all the answers, knowing I'm not so smart that I've worked this all out. God, we, we repent of our pretending to be so smart. <laughs> But God, I, we also repent of thinking that you don't love truth. God, I pray we will be a church of faith, of real faith, that have a really good reason to believe, that are still trying to work it out, that are placing our trust in an event in history, in the scriptures that describe it, in the person of Jesus Christ who achieved it, who showed us what God was really perfectly like. And we stand confidently. And then, Lord, I pray that we'll be a people of faith in action, that we will act as if this is true. We will act as if we are loved, even if we're not feeling loved on the day. We're feeling tired and annoyed. We would just act as if we're loved because we believe it's true. And ultimately, Father, I thank you that the fate of the world is not on me. (laughs) It's not on our action. It's on an event in history. And you said, Jesus, 
to tell us die. You said it is finished. And so our hope today, we are sure of our hope. Our hope is not in an idea. It's not in a religion. It's not in a church. Our hope is in you, Jesus Christ, the perfecter of our faith. So we stand in your, in your living hope, God. I pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Thanks, Dan, so much. It sounds like it's going to be an awesome series. Now, guys, we want to make sure you are connected into our church. So visit lifepoint.org.au, fill out a Connect card, and someone will contact you. If you want to join small groups, that is where you'll go as well, at lifepoint.org.au forward slash connect. Now, we are a family here, and we do family camps. So make sure you come along to Camp Somerset in April. And yeah, just join along, connect in, and we just want to know you more and get connected with you more. So yeah. Now, that's the end of our series today. So thank you so much for joining me wherever you are, in your lounge room with friends, out in the park. And we just want to say thank you so much. And we will see you back at church next week. Bye.